There is something fascinating about prototype smartphones, being able to see how the hardware evolved internally before the phones were announced to the public, the unique factory markings or stickers used by engineers to identify the phones, the specialized software used for debugging and quality control. For this video, I have acquired two distinctive engineering samples of budget smartphones, with hardware differences compared to the final, and software that you and I were never meant to see. This is the LG G3S, a cut-down budget variant of the G3. LG used a similar strategy to Samsung's S3, S4 and S5 mini lineup of the time. Use the same name as the flagship, but make a reference to the fact that it's smaller, and quietly omit the fact that every single component has been cut down to fit the lower price tag. This phone has also been sold as the LG G3 Beat in certain regions, and my specific variant is the European D722V, with non-carrier customised firmware. On the front of the device, we can see not for sale imprinted behind the glass, as well as the hardware revision and the internal identifier. And for the star of the show, take a look at the back. The device doesn't quite look like a G3S, does it? There is a generic rear panel on the phone with no LG logo, or any design for that matter. It is solid black plastic, without the brushed aluminium look of the final black variant of the G3S. Likewise, the sides of the device carry the same look. They are fully black. The black plastic also wraps around the top and bottom of the front of the device, most noticeably on the chin. There is an extra cutout around the headphone jack, and the top of the rear panel also has a mystery cutout. Oh, and most importantly, the power button is square instead of circle, like on the final revision of the phone. Taking this back cover off, we can see some differences compared to the final, like a lack of the blue stuff around the speaker, which may have been added to improve water resistance. The final makes a direct reference to being a V variant, while mine doesn't, which does make me wonder if the firmware had been reflashed at some point to the V variant, or if the D722 is an all-encompassing model name for the G3S, and the V was added later in the phone's development to specify the region. While my markings say D722-0414, the final say 0813. The final has a deeper cutout for what looks like the water damage indicator. We can also see a sticker under the battery written Korean. Translated, it says, must be used by a pre-approved employee and must be returned after use. The date of manufacture for the battery was five months before the phone was released. While batteries tend to be produced months before the phone, that still seems like a rather early manufacturing date. I will take the phone apart shortly, but for now, let's talk software. This is stock Android Lollipop compiled in April 2015. This isn't the firmware that the phone was released with, as it originally came with KitKat, though this is the first Lollipop release destined for Europe. While there are no cool debug apps that I can show off, I can show you MiniOS, a special partition that functions similarly to TWRP if I had to guess. And since Google, as always, is completely useless at giving me an answer, here's what ChatGPT had to say, provided it's not hallucinating. MiniOS is essentially a small Linux image that is possibly used at a factory, but definitely used by LG's repair technicians to check if the hardware is functioning properly, and can be accessed by a secret code within Android. Anyway, let me just bring up the specs really quickly. The G3S has a 5-inch 720p LCD, a Snapdragon 400 CPU with 1GB of RAM and 8GB of storage. We have an 8MP camera on the rear, as well as a 1.3MP camera at the front. The battery is a 2540mAh unit, and we also happen to have an IR blaster, notification LED, headphone jack with FM support and microSD card support. So yes, pretty unexceptional specs, but that was just the case owning mid-range Android phones 10 years ago. And as you can see, the LCD panel also has some damage under the glass. LG's Lollipop skin is also strange. It's very much a mishmash of ideas with no coherent design. Icons that are circular, square, and some don't have a shape at all. There are different sizes of icons, tabbed apps and widgets on the home screen like on Android 4, redundant system pop-ups throughout operation of the system, no way to pull the notification panel all the way down like on stock Lollipop, and more. Though I have to say, it is cool that there is a guest mode that is activated via a different pin or pattern. That is something that Samsung and LG were doing at that time, and I'm surprised that every modern phone doesn't have this feature. We also have QSlide, which are these mini versions of system apps for basic multitasking. And we do get a cool display of animation, which looks like a CRT turning off. But otherwise, it's a pretty basic device. And with only 3.4GB of storage out of the box, I'm not even going to bother connecting to Wi-Fi and having Google Play services take up most of the space and slowing down the device to a crawl. So let's move on to the disassembly. This is by far one of the easiest electronic disassemblies that I've ever done. The phone is extremely repairable. With the exception of the micro USB port, the easiest component to break over time, everything else is on gold pads. And here's something strange. Take a look at what the motherboard says. D725. That is the AT&T model. So, D725 motherboard? All of the stickers and plastic prints say D722, and the firmware says D722V. What is going on? Unfortunately, we may never know. So let's move on to the second device. This is the second generation Moto E from February 2015, released six months after the G3S. With this being a low-end device of the time, its specs are completely uninteresting. Snapdragon 200, which indicates only 3G support, 
1GB of RAM and 8GB of storage, with 4GB available to the user. The display is 4.5 inches at a resolution of 960x540 and its battery is 2390mAh. So let's take a look at the more interesting aspects of this phone, starting with the hardware. On the front, similarly to the LG, we have not for sale text written under the glass, as well as a Motorola logo with a special matrix, most likely used to identify the hardware of the phone or who it was given to. And on the right of that, we have a data matrix. You may have noticed that the trim pieces are missing, and I'm unsure if this was the case from the factory or the previous user misplaced them, since this phone was actually being used as a normal phone by the previous user, shockingly. But yes, on the final model, you can actually take off the trim to access the SD card and SIM card trays. On the right hand side, we have the buttons, as well as a mysterious hole, which on the final housed the pullout sticker with the IMEI. On the left, we have three holes, two for dual SIM functionality and one for the SD card. Interestingly enough, despite this running the dual SIM firmware, the second SIM slot has never been soldered on, and there is a block of metal stopping us from accidentally inserting a card in there. On the final single SIM model, that slot is very unimpressively covered up. So yeah, what's the deal here? Well, this is the XT1511 model of the Moto E, which seems to be the Latin American variant. And to wrap up things about the hardware, we have a headphone jack, a 5 megapixel rear camera, and a 0.3 megapixel front camera. In terms of software, we finally have some internal apps. First up is bug to go which uploads crash reports to an internal Dropbox server on Motorola servers. It is interesting because unlike on Android normally, you can actually see the Java exception errors and see exactly why the app crashed. Next up is Battery Tracer, another stupidly interesting app, since it lets you see wake clocks, which as the name suggests, are apps and services that are preventing your phone from going to sleep. We also get different types of reports for battery discharge, and you have a GUI for dumpsys, which also as the name suggests, lets you dump reports from different system services. We also have an extremely comprehensive info screen, which you never see on internal applications, since the engineers know what their own software does. There's even a link to an internal wiki, though this has never been archived. Invoking a secret code in the phone app also granted me CQA test, which like LG's MiniOS and its Android service menu app equivalents, lets you test every component of the phone to make sure that they work as they should. I found the loudspeaker test particularly amusing, since it plays back across the MIDI. Still, better than LG's annoying MP3. Those poor factory workers and service technicians. We also have an app confirming that the phone was destined for Brazil, that would presumably let you download local apps. As well as a mysterious IQ data upload app, which I have no idea what it does. There's also a demo mode and a factory assembly mode, neither of which I'm going to touch in case I wipe the user partition and the cool apps, so let's leave that for the time being. If I get time in the future to learn how to dump via ADB, I will do that. Oh, and speaking of which, Fastboot also reports the phone as being an engineering unit. But yeah, that's about it for this video. Let me know what you guys thought in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out my playlist on historically significant phones.